think is that History Day, um, you know, we have all these coordinators everywhere. And so um, a lot of people who have a lot more time um, have been able to uh, put together some standards that we're going to be using all through the year. All the states are going to be using these standards. They've done some stuff to sort of break down, um, you know, put together the new rule book and break down what that means for everybody. Um, and so I just wanted to pass on the result of everybody else's hard work today. Um, because everything is a, a little bit different from state to state. Uh, we've decided what we want to do this year is uh, give everybody a little bit more time. So we're bumping, uh, we're going to combine all three regionals since they're virtual regionals. Um, into one super regional. And what we're gonna do is everybody's gonna be able to send the same number of projects per school or per home school, um, which is four projects in each category. So for junior individual, for senior junior group. <laughs> um, and um, we're, we're just gonna make as many rooms as we have to and send the top three from each room to state. So it would be like, we would send the top three from each regional to state, but we're just gonna do the top three from each room. So we're gonna schedule it like we would schedule regionals, but we're gonna mix everybody up a little bit. And then every school and homeschool teacher uh, can also nominate uh, best of school category. So those, uh, uh, one in the individual category and one in the group category. So those projects would also be eligible to go on to state if no other projects from that school place um, as, as a way of making sure that all the schools get a chance to go through that, that hall process. Um, and then we also push state back a little bit. So Hopefully this will give everybody a little bit of time um, to, uh, to do, do some more research and to support your students in, in um, pulling the projects together. Um, so there's a new rule book. And again, this is available at nmhumanities.org slash teacher resources. It's also available um, on the nhd.org website. Um, so the, here, here are the biggest changes. Um, so entries need to be in English, um, but you know, of course there can be other languages if English translations are provided. Only the English language word counts count. So for example, uh, a couple years ago, we had some students at West Mesa who did a project on Corridos. So the corridos in Spanish were um, counted as uh, quotations or uh, you know, non-student composed words. The translations counted as student composed words. Um, so with the, with the bibliography, they want to tighten up a little bit about the annotations. And they want to make sure that even if you were looking at, say, reference sources like Wikipedia or an encyclopedia or you know the big book of whatever, that you're um, that you're including that in the bibliography. Um, and they want to have clear annotations that give a sense of how that research was used in the project. Um, uh, with the written materials, uh, all projects have to be a, uh, have to have a process paper, and this is um, new going to be new for paper students. Paper students haven't had to put together process papers um, and have the um, and and have to have that process paper included in the title page for their paper. So that's that's going to be new, and uh, you know. I, Certainly at regionals, you know, if people don't have their paperwork perfectly in order, as, as you all know, we're very forgiving and give the students lots of opportunity to make these corrections. But um, as you all can imagine, the closer you get to state, the more um, 
the, the more uh, we expect everybody to follow these rules. Um, so uh, there's a new set of questions for process papers and they want you, they want students to state their historical argument. And um, the way I understand the historical argument to work is that in, in the context of History Day is that the students have to say, the world used to be like this, my topic happened and now it's different because of my topic. And they need to be supporting that argument with those primary sources. So they need to be able to state it. You know, um, uh, Bethany and I were talking earlier about uh, a project that was, you know, once upon a time, there was no accessibility for people uh, it, with mobility issues. And then some people got together and they started advocating for curb cutting. And um, now the, the, uh, there are federal regulations govern, governing um, accessibility for, for buildings. So, you know, making that complete argument with the context and the topic, the, the events of the topic and the impact um, needs to be somehow stated simply, I guess, in the process paper. Um, and again, uh, no weapons. <laughs> um, um, so with, uh, there's some other changes with uh, the way that papers get counted. Um, and um, some changes with the time limits in media for exhibits. Um, exhibits like, and things are going to be a little different this year with exhibits, but exhibits like websites are supposed to stand on their own and not have anything that forces uh, the viewer to go outside of the exhibit. So there can be something like an iPad or um, something as part of the exhibit that the viewers can operate themselves, but it needs to be integrated within the exhibit. Um, uh, so performances, no audience participation. Websites, uh, they've made uh, Web Central uh, the official requirement for um, building uh, websites and, and that's had a lot of improvements this year. So if you have students who are uh, feeling burned after last year trying to create stuff in Web Central, it's a lot better this year. Um, um, media, media limits, um, homepage requirements, again, no external links. The website needs to stand on its own. So, um, uh, and then they need, uh, the required written material needs to be submitted as a PDF. And um, I believe there are some resources uh, on the teacher resources page. If not, I will check. Um, but the, there are some free PDF makers. So this year, especially with the virtual contest, students are, are, are just going to have to make a bunch of PDFs and, and they can't submit in pages and they can't submit docs or open document format or, or anything like that. It's um, so there are a few a few free things that um, that we've shared out, and we'll make sure to share them out again. Um, new evaluation forms, um, and this is sort of a huge change. So um, instead of it being sixty percent historical quality, twenty percent relation to the theme, and twenty percent clarity of presentation it's now 80% historical quality. And I'm, I'm just gonna pull this up and share this instead. Um, oh. Hang on a second. <laughs> I outsmarted myself here. Um, too many tabs, too many tabs, here they are. Okay. Um,
Can you all see that? It, said, it should say NHD documentary. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so as you can see, this is really significantly different from years past. Um, one of the impetuses in changing this the way that it was changed um, is because judges were just, and you all probably know this, judges were just all over the map in terms of like, you know, is something superior or is it excellent? Like I'm in a superior mood right now, so it's superior, right? So this takes a lot of the guesswork out of trying to figure out if something is good or excellent or um, where, where it falls on that spectrum. Um, so again, historical quality is 80%. And a lot of these are going to look the same. So did they do wide research? Did they use available primary resources? Did they, um, is there context and uh, impact? Do they um, integrate multiple perspectives? That was the broad research category from before um, that was never very clear to a lot of judges. So again, this should, help the judges sort of zero in on like what exactly is broad research supposed to be. Um, significance in history, that's the same. Historical accuracy, that's the same. And then there's a category down here um, for student voice. And um, uh, this, this came about, I think, as a part of a larger evolution in the field. But um, what, what they really want to see, like the practical application of this, is that the students, students had drifted into using secondary sources to present the analysis of their topic. Like, this is why the topic matters. Historian, you know, Joe Schmo says, quote, the topic matters because blah, 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 blah. And um, we, wanna, we wanna urge students to present this entire historical argument in their own voices. Um, and and what, what uh, in their own words. And we know that it uses up word count, right? We know, we know that using the secondary sources was a great, workaround for keeping the word counts under control. But um, we want, what, what, what would be optimal, as, as I understand it, is if students use their secondor, uh, secondary source research to establish the context for their historical argument, like World War II was happening, you know, and here's what that was like. And that's, you know, a really good use of the secondary sources. But to use the primary source research to uh, discuss the topic, and then the Navajo code talkers were doing this, and here's all these resources, and to do the analysis of the impact. So those primary sources should be supporting the argument um, talking about the topic itself and then talking about the impact. And um, one of the coordinators suggested that this spectrum of student voice from fair to superior um, is all, can also be considered sort of as a, a developmental infrastructure for higher order critical thinking. Um, so that, you know, we don't expect students to have these innate abilities to be able to um, um, to be able to to present this analysis in their own words or even to formulate their own analysis based on the research. But this is this this is the path that would like them to take as they are able. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. Oh, you know what? Maybe I should share it again for a second. Sorry. Because there's a whole other page. Um, so there's also not evidence. So if the kids just didn't do it, they didn't do it. It's not poor, right? There's just, it's not there. 
Um, we are giving them a lot more structure for uh, the judges, giving the judges a lot more structure for critical feedback, for written feedback. And um, for the online judging, they are, um, they have a minimum, it's like uh, 300 characters or something. And they gripe about it that we all feel like that, that is the minimum, right? <laughs> That's a bare minimum. Um, so then they have the clarity of presentation and the rules are just yes, no, yes, no. And then they can have some general comments. Um, so uh, it's a little bit longer evaluation. We were hoping it gives the judges a lot more guidance in terms of what we're asking for and how to give that constructive feedback to students um, so that the, the, you know, the students have a lot better sense of what, um, of what's being asked of them in the next round um, when they go to do their revisions. Um, so, hang on a second. All right. Um, so uh, one thing to, uh, one last note, I'm glad I had this up because I forgot. Um, one last note that um, I want to make is that student voice is not student opinion. You know, um, doing, doing analysis um, is, you know, evidence-based research. It's not, you know, taking history and forming it for uh, your own opinion. And so I think that's not totally clear, especially for younger students, uh, about what the difference between having it be in their own voice and having it be their opinion about what happened. You know, if they're making any kind of argument, you know, this, things are like this because this happened, they need to have that evidence um, supporting the argument. All right, um, and and let me let me take a, a quick minute to answer questions in the chat. Nick, um, you said um, you did you missed the judging rubric. Um, the uh, Bethany shared the link uh, where they are up at NHD, and um, the they're also all available on the teacher resources page. Uh, that nmhumanities.org slash teacher resources, where they should be. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, let's see, sorry, I keep losing my chat. I have too many buttons. Uh, Gretchen, that's a great question. How does a virtual performance differ from a documentary? Let's, uh, let's move on to talking about our virtual contests this year. So, um, We'll deal with the first three categories quickly because they're super easy. Um, documentaries, the only guidance they have is uh, guidance uh, about the platform for accepting the, the files. Uh, for last year, for the virtual state contest, we used SmugMug. It does have a three gigabyte uh, size constraint. And so um, if if we have strong objections to smug mug, I'd like to hear them. Otherwise, we'll just go with smug mug and just ask your students to make sure their files are compressed to three gigs or under. Um, websites and, and papers, um, you know, besides the changes in the rule book, like papers having process papers and having to have the process paper word count on the title page and the changes in how citations are, are counted, the changes of NHD with Web Central, there aren't a lot of changes. Uh, students have been submitting their stuff online for the last couple of years. Um, and so I think they've got the deal pretty well down. Um, Aaron, if I don't have them under, on that teacher resources page, I'll fix it as soon as we're done here. Thank you, thank you for checking. So I just, speaking of NHD Web Central, 
I didn't know whether everybody had been using it <clears throat> or whether you've been able to support your students, whether you want to. Is this something that um, you feel like you want to get up to speed on? So I'm going to launch a poll. And if you all could take a couple minutes and just sort of let me know the best way to give you information about NHG Web Central or pass it on or find somebody who's smarter than I am who can give you information about it. <laughs> That's actually my real plan. <laughs> Oh, great. Okay, super. Thank you. Um, so I think we can do all those things. Uh, we can do, uh, we can do a webinar. Um, and um, we can, uh, there is written documentation that I can make sure is shared out in more useful places. And we'll do the same thing, uh, uh, recording the, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you everybody for, sh for sharing that. Whoops, sorry. Is it still sharing? No. All right, um, let's talk about exhibits um, for the virtual contest. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing here and Share this document. So this document I'm 100% sure is linked to from the teacher resources page because I did that right before. Um, so what, what there is is a template and they've filled out the templates in a couple of ways so students can look at some samples or examples of the template. Um, and um, the the idea is, um, the idea is to make it sort of like a, a trifold. So it would be the title bar across the top, you know, whatever's down on the table as far as artifacts, you know, um, and then your your different panels. Um, so um, the slides allow the students to sort of design it. Um, and insert what they want. They can have up to 20 slides. They don't have to have 20 slides. Um, and uh, a recommendation that uh, one coordinator gave is because this is a category that's usually like kids who are very visual or who like to, you know, futz around with glitter and, and glue. Um, you know, they should think about, and I think this goes for clarity of presentation, they should think about designing each one of these panels as if it was contiguous, like as if you could print it out and paste it up on something. And maybe if they feel so moved, they can print it out and, and paste it up on something. Um, it's, it's a little bit, uh, I'm not sure how kids are, are really supposed to do like artifacts, if they have artifacts where the, on the table space would be. Um, but they can take pictures of things. Um, they can include uh, media, so you can embed media, um, like an audio file in the PDF um, or in, this, in the slides um, as you write the PDF. Um, and so, like I said, there are some examples. Um, there are some examples in the folder that's linked to from the teacher resources page of things that are all filled out with, um, you know, here's what it would look like. Mm -hmm. um, and then just to note the exhibit, when the exhibit students turn in their paperwork, the exhibit PDF is going to be separate from their paperwork PDF. So the title page process paper and bibliography go in one place and the um, exhibit template you know, with all their exhibit things in it goes, uh, is, is a separate document. So, um, does anybody have any questions at this point? Are we doing okay? Um, all right. All right, 
So the, um, we're finally at Gretchen's question, performances. Um, so uh, performances are um, distinct from documentaries in that it's gonna be the, the students doing the performance. And um, unlike last year, we are gonna require a video for performance students. Um, and the performance has to be recorded in a single take with no editing. So documentaries, you know, those documentary students can edit until the cow cows come home. They can, they can spend hundreds of hours editing. Um, performance students have to do one take. Some affiliates are requiring that there be a clock on screen somewhere so that it's, you know, it's clear that it's all one take. Um, and it can't be edited after the fact. Um, so uh, some things that are not in, in the document, and I'll, I'll switch over to this in a second. Um, groups have a few platforms that they're constrained to. So groups need to do it through uh, Zoom, Google Meet, or uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, appropriate adult help is, um, yeah, yeah, Louisa, absolutely. This is why, um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely COVID restrictions. They can't get together. So appropriate adult help would be uh, an adult providing a platform for the students to rehearse and record their performances. Um, so, uh, you know, if you had a teacher account, you could use your teacher account. That would be appropriate adult help. Um, Lynn uh, O'Hara has said appropriate adult help is also helping students troubleshoot doing group recordings. Um, and so if they're having trouble with the tech or audio or whatever, that is a appropriate adult help to host that and to provide tech support in making those recordings. Um, so uh, Louisa, if they, can, if they can get together to do their projects, um, and then we can find ways um, to, to host them or to help them get together to do their recordings. They are allowed to use whatever bells and whistles there might be within the video conferencing platform. So, for example, if uh, you're doing a performance and it's about a president, you can use a Zoom background that's the White House, right? That's okay. So um, you can incorporate things in your performance um, on Zoom, whatever, whatever tricks the platform can do. Um, Individual performances have no constraints over um, the platform that they use to record their, um, uh, their project. They just can't have somebody else holding the camera. So that's just like in pre-COVID times, um, you know, you have to operate the, operate the stuff yourself uh, if you're not working in a group. Um, and I'm just going to Go ahead and share. Um, 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 so the other thing with virtual performances, again, like the exhibits, they'll have a, a single packet, um, <clears throat> excuse me, unlike the exhibits, they'll have a single packet of paperwork that will have their title page, their process paper, their bibliography, and this companion worksheet. Um, and so the companion worksheet actually goes through, um, so it has their, their, the link to wherever they're hosting the recording. Again, we can host everything at SmugMug. They're just gonna have to keep their videos under three gigabytes. Um, and then they have um, the opportunity to talk a little bit about their characters, 
and uh, their props, uh, any kind of sets they're using, costumes, um, and uh, anything, uh, you know, where they have sort of constructed it in order to add to the, um, you know, th they've drawn it from primary sources. So I was wearing a mob cap because in the picture uh, taken of her at the time, she was wearing a mob cap. And so um, this Hall Companion document uh, is actually great, I think, uh, and it can really help performance students to think through um, what kind of props they want to use, what kind of costumes they want to use, what kind of set stuff they want to use, or if they're going to be using Zoom backgrounds, what do those look like? Um, you know, if they're, if it's an individual performer who's sort of changing hats or changing persona, it's a way for them to outline that. Um, and uh, really sort of give the judges a little bit more information and context about what they're doing. So I think that's kind of exciting. I think performance kids put a lot of effort into their performances and the judges don't necessarily always uh, catch the nuances. Um, uh, so Victor and Louisa, with the COVID restrictions, uh, they should not be performing in the same room unless they can get together, uh, you know, unless they're part of a household. Does that make sense? I mean, the, the expectation is that groups won't be able to gather and we'll just have to record over a video conferencing platform. So then they would be essentially looking at the four little squares or five little squares, whatever it is. And then I say this, and then you say that, and you say that, and you say that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then, okay, so then like on individual um, performance, you said that somebody cannot hold the camera and record for an individual performance? That's my understanding. I mean, I've, I've, I know that's the case with documentaries. I mean, if they can prop their camera up or something. So they would have to put it on a tripod, let's say, hit start, run around to the front, do their business, and then come around and turn it off again? Right, well, like I'm thinking of um, Sierra Trabasco, one of Amy's students last year, who was one of the few students, uh, individual performance students to submit a video. And she just had her phone propped up, you know, and sort of, you know, mm -hmm. got, got the picture right on her phone and, and had it propped up and right. just did her performance that way. Um, you know, individual students can also use a video conferencing platform to record a performance if they wanted to you know, get it, get their laptop set up right and do it. Uh, it's just that they're not constrained in terms of platform. But you know what, I'll seek clarification about that, Louisa. Um, um, because I don't see why it would be so bad for somebody to stand there and record them. It, to me, it may, I mean, maybe it's me. I just, I know it's, I know it's uh, against the rules for docs. Well, yeah, no, like if you did an interview for a documentary, you would obviously take a, um, a tricord or a, a tripod and you would set it up and then you would hit play and somebody would do the interview and that kind of stuff. So that makes sense because that's running the equipment because you're going to use that product for your 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 documentary or your website that kind of thing that makes sense but like for an individual performance to have somebody not be able to just hit to hold the camera and record that doesn't seem that seems like putting undue stress on a kid when the person holding the camera really isn't doing anything they're not moving because i understand that the camera has to be stationary so I can't like pan the room while you move around. If I just, if it's just there, it's like it's being on a tripod, except the tripod is a human that's just holding the camera. Right, right. Because we wouldn't be running around the room following you. That's not appropriate. Because I think last year for regionals or for state or whatever, they were allowed, but they could not move the camera. So it was, it was like on right. a tripod or somebody just held it. A fixed camera. Mm -hmm. Right, there you go. That's what I'm trying to say. 
So to me, that makes sense. Otherwise, to me, it sounds like we're just stressing whoever's doing an individual performance that they have to manage that and remember their lines and do all that when they didn't sign up for that doing the performance. Oh, yeah, well, because like in a real performance, I wouldn't have to do that. Right. That that has nothing to do with my product. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Let me get clarification on that. I think it's a good point. And I, I did want to say, just going back to that um, nmhumanities.org slash teacher resources page, the link is uh, uh, where it says getting started with National History Day. The link is to the right of that. It says it's called NHD Evaluation Forms Round One All-in-One Merged PDF is the name of it. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and make it a little bit, maybe a, a better of a link. But um, um, but that's all the evaluation forms for all the categories. So you can, you can really see the breakdown of, in all the categories. So that's all the slides I had. Does anybody have questions or? <laughs> this, yeah, Brent. Hey, um, I, I have a couple. One, uh, one, and maybe it's just me, you can wait. Um, I don't have the whole picture of the visuals. I also have the performance, you started the individual performance saying anything goes. And as I'm listening to people, I'm like, could they do a screencastify and use features of that platform as a performance? Because that's kind of what teachers do when we perform in 2020. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my, my understanding is whatever platform, whatever video conferencing platform they're using, they can use whatever the platform allows. And, and then my other thing, like I said, I just don't have the picture of the super regional in my head. And I, um, when I first got on, I was coming in from a hike and my wife was driving, so maybe I missed something. Right, um, and, and Gretchen's got a good question too, which is, is there a separate deadline for papers? We're gonna have, because all the projects are gonna be submitted as digital files, we're gonna ask for all the projects to be submitted at the same time. So papers, websites, exhibits, performances, docs, everything gets turned in at the same time. We'll, we give the judges a little bit longer to review everything and to be able to conference with each other. And then we're gonna schedule interviews with the students. And um, we don't have the, um, we're working on that part. <laughs> um, we're working hard on that part, but um, the way that uh, super regionals will work, and I just, I don't have a sense this year, Brent, of how many students are participating statewide or how many students are participating but maybe don't want to compete, you know? Um, so we won't really know until we get closer to regionals, but um, if, if we were to take all the students who, who competed at regionals last year, we would have like, you know, maybe two rooms of senior group exhibits, um, maybe three rooms of junior group exhibits, um, you know, maybe uh, three rooms each of junior websites, uh, right? So <clears throat> we had the group of junior websites going from the Northwest Regional, group of junior websites going from the Central Regional, group of junior websites going from the Southern Regional, right? Um, so we can think of them all as a room, you know, each regional is a room, but we're gonna mix and match the students a little bit more. So everybody gets to compete against everybody else. And that way, you know, if we're scheduling for a regional, we try to make it so that the kids from the same school aren't scheduled next to the kids from the same school so every, you know, there's a little bit of a mix. Um, we're going to do the same thing with the super regional so that there's just a really nice mix uh, in each room of uh, students from around the state. And um, my, my max when I'm scheduling is usually like six to nine projects. Um, any more than that, the judges get really crabby. <laughs> and they feel, 
uh, they feel um, oppressed <laughs> and and overworked and um, so so that's sort of what I'm thinking is you know if there are more than nine projects in a given category we'll divide it out into rooms and then we'll have the top three projects from each room go on to a state does that make sense I, I get that part so February, what happens on February 26? Is that just a deadline or is, are there going to be interviews scheduled on February 26? Uh, what does that date mean? Cause, cause I'm thinking the kid, this is what the kids, what's the deadline? When do I have to have this thing? So that's the most important question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So we want them to have their stuff in on February 26 we're all going to take a couple of days to just review everything and make sure that it's complete like that we have the paperwork for everything or that there's actually a file where the kids said that there's a file you know they put in a link and it's actually a link and not just like a local directory path or something like that um and we'll pass it on to the judges and then um, we will be scheduling interviews that week, that week of March 1st. Um, and I think we'll have a little bit better sense before the contest start of, you know, whether we're going to be doing category interviews on specific days or whether it's going to be like junior interviews and senior interviews or how that's going to work. So hopefully by the time we get everybody starting to get registered in January, we'll have, we'll have a little bit of a plan for um, what that's going to look like in terms of scheduling. But all your kids have to know is do or die. They need to be registered and have their projects turned in by midnight, Friday, February 26. So, okay, so, so then, Alan, it has to be 11.29 on that Friday. Otherwise, it's Thursday night into Friday morning. So we have to make sure that it's 11.59 that Friday night at midnight. But on the interviews, if we're doing um, interviews during the week to accommodate judges, I need to know that at least two weeks in advance because I have to Mustang or activity absence my kids out of class. Otherwise, they're absent. So like, and I think that depends on, because it's like, it's like taking the kids out of school, even though they're just not attending class. Otherwise it's unexcused. So I, I can't wait to the last minute to like do that as a teacher speaking, because um, it, it won't fly. And, and it, I guess it depends on your school district. APS, our kids meet every day. They have classes every day on a regular schedule. I teach a full day. So um, I don't know that we can just say your deadline is going to be the 26th and that makes sense, but I think it would be better if we schedule all junior division like on Thursday and then like all senior division on Friday or whatever. And then that way the teachers going in know that I need to Mustang these kids out on this day, two weeks down the pike or whatever. I, I hear that, Louisa, and I'm wondering. Uh, I, I'm wondering the same question as Aaron, which is, um, what do people think about doing interviews after school or in the evening? I don't have a problem with that. Um, our kids, uh, mid afternoon to evening, is probably good for our kids. Or at least schedule it. They don't have classes, I'll say that. <laughs> I think as long as there was a, um, a heads up in enough advance. Um, I know I have some kids who are still having like club sports meetings, even though they're the small groups and whatever, mm -hmm. um, that might be happening even in, you know, February or March or any, any time in the spring. So you know, they're all anxious for sports to get back up. So I think we would need enough of an advance to let them know that that was a possibility that they would have to block off that time. Mm -hmm. All right, well, well, we'll come up with a plan. I think it, if, if we can do evenings, that sounds like the least amount of administrative headache for everybody. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Um, but if we can't do evenings, then um, 
we'll make sure to give everybody a heads up well in advance. Um, uh, Honestly, I think evenings might be more difficult because then you run into dinner um, between five and seven-ish, give or take. And then you don't want to be interviewing after like 8, 8.30 because middle schoolers go to bed early. High schoolers stay up till God knows when to do their homework. Um, but, you know, it, I think running into the evening is like running into family time. And I, and I don't see how, I think that just might be more difficult, uh, in my opinion. I think maybe if they could just pick just decide on Thursday or Friday is this day and on this or that day, or even a Saturday would probably be more feasible than, than Thursday, Friday, if you want to avoid all the hassle, we just need to know. I mean, I'm okay either way. I just need to tell the kids that, okay, you guys compete on this day, just like we do at nationals. On nationals, junior division goes on Monday, so don't plan, and then senior division goes on Tuesday, that's the end. So, and I don't know how that's going to look with the judging situation, if we're going to be splitting judges then we would need to have the two days, obviously. But if it's just one set of judges for each division, then I think we can run it on one day. But I don't, that's, that, I, mean, I, I guess that's going to depend on how many kids you have to begin with that to compete and stuff like that. But, and it's going to depend on the judges. How many judges do you have? And can we split that up so that we're not sharing judges or whatever? Um, and Louisa, that's a really good point about the judges. Um, when, when we do start open up registration in January, please uh, encourage all your friends and loved ones to sign up to, to judge uh, because um, the, more, the more judges, the merrier as always. Um, I think, you know, Louisa, there's a couple of challenges that the national office brought up. Um, one is, you know, how many, so if you're doing interviews, say via Zoom, you know, you can only, out of an organizational account, you can only do so many Zoom meetings at a right. time, right? Um, but, you know, if we can certainly divide this, you know, divide it up so that we were all doing different Zoom meetings. There is a question about, um, whether you need a background check chaperone, a supervisor, like a coordinator or a teacher in the interview room. Um, and also what, uh, you know, whether we need to choose a platform where people can't make recordings of minors. And this all, all has to do with minor privacy laws. <clears throat> And so, I mean, it's not because there's been actually anything that happened. Um, so we need to decide, one, whether we want to do recordings of the judge interviews, two, how we, how we need to split up chaperoning if we indeed do need to chaperone the interviews um, and maybe host them. And, and then three, if we do make a recording, you know, at what point do we destroy that recording? so that we're not preserving recordings of minor students. So, so. then um, on a sidebar, last year for, because um, I teach bilingual education at West Mesa High School, and we have to present, our students are working on their bilingual seals. Mm -hmm. So we had to flip automatically from an in-person interview situation, presenting their portfolios all that to an online digital performance. And I didn't do the logistics because if I did that, then we'd still be standing around looking stupid. Um, but this is what we ended up doing. So we ended up scheduling the rooms on Google Meet, I think is what we used. Um, because and then the kids, the judges were given the, they all came to like one room for the judging orientation in the morning. And then they were given like breakout rooms sort of. And now that Google does breakout rooms, it would probably be easier than the nightmare we did last year. And then they were sent to the breakout rooms. And then the kids would come to another room where I was in the waiting room to say, and we would like review and talk and just chat and calm them down. And then at their designated time, they were sent, they went to the other room and did their business there. And then the kids that were there came back to debrief with me. So we had like a waiting room that I chaperoned. And then we had the kids go to the other room to do the panel. And the, uh, we had another, our coordinator, he popped in and out of all of the rooms so that he could see that. But we didn't record anything because in a real judging situation, 
we wouldn't be recording the, the presentation if the kids were talking to the judges anyway. So I don't know that we need to record. Um, I, I don't know why we would do that because we wouldn't go back to talk to the kids a second time. If I had questions, I'd go to the process paper or the bib. So now we have that project as paperwork, but I mean, maybe we could do something along those lines. I don't know, you know, and then that way the kids, cause I, I would volunteer to like pop into rooms to chaperone other rooms if we need to do that. That's not a problem, but that way they're only going into the rooms that they're supposed to go to at the appropriate time. So I don't know. So they, maybe they could check in in one room and then we would send them to the link. So they would only get the link that day, maybe. Or, or just make breakout rooms for the judge right. groups. Yeah, and that might be too. Um, and my, my understanding is, I know with Zoom, I don't know, I don't know as much about Google Meet, but I know with Zoom, you can create the breakout rooms in advance. Yes, yes. So we could make them according to the schedule. Okay. Well, what do you all think? Would you rather have all the interviews on one day and just pick that day now? Or pick that day as soon as we know what we're doing? <laughs> um, and have your kids out of school? What's, what's the easiest thing for, for people? Victor? The easiest thing would be great to be able to, to determine that right now, but I think that there's a lot of variables that we still need to take into account. Like you said, the number of students participating and our judges' uh, willingness in their schedules. Um, I think that's gonna let us know whether or not there, there's gonna be enough time to do it in an evening or in an afternoon, or if it's gonna need to take place all day on a Saturday. So I think that's just kind of hard to determine at this point. I mean, it, if you want to, when we come back after the Christmas break, you can, you can send out to all of our uh, sponsors to say, okay, who's, who's competing? So you, get, you can have a rough estimate of how many students are competing in each category so that we can set up your rooms and try to figure out how many judges you're going to need and then reach out to them to see what, what are they going to be willing to do because, I mean, some, some judges are, you know, are working till five o'clock, so they're not going to be able to they be available after five on a weekday and some may just be available on weekends. What if we had, um, what if we had, so I'm looking at the calendar right now. Um, I have the judging scheduled. So we're going to take a week. It looks like we're going to take a week, make sure everybody's projects are good. We're going to turn them around back to the judges um, at, as soon as possible. Um, but they will have until the 12th to get us their judge results. So we could do, so the 12th is a Friday. That's March 12th. So we could do maybe different slots on Thursday morning and Friday evening or Thursday evening and Friday morning so that students who need to do it in the context of school or um, could, do, could do it then. And then the judges, um, the judges will know in advance um, you know, also to take off because the judges will take off for, um, you know, to come to the contest all day, right? If you, if you know in advance, you're going to have to, you know, not be working or be available for the students during these times. Um, so let me clarify, we're, we're turning in everything on the 26th of February. Mm -hmm. That's our deadline. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking if you schedule interviews for the 6th that Saturday, um, that gives the judges the week to look at what they're going to be looking at during that first week. And then, because they would have to meet, they have to have time to meet and deliberate as well. So if they just watch, I know, I'm thinking maybe if they just do interviews on Saturday the 6th and then the judges can meet on Monday the 8th in the evening to determine where who goes where and then present those results to you guys by the, because when's the award ceremony? No, the, the judges have until, um, could they, the judges get two weeks. It's close to two weeks to review the project. So they need to get their determinations uh, submitted March 12th. And when so, is the award? Uh, March 14th. So 
So you have exactly one day to make the slideshow or the PowerPoint or whatever. For re I think you're chopping off your head. Oh my goodness. Well, no, it's not that bad because you can make them in advance and just pop them in. That's what we did for nationals. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I'm probably just going to steal your same template from State Louisa. <laughs> works good. <laughs> if it works, why, why mess with it? That's exactly correct. Um, um, so, okay, so what I'm blocking in on the calendar, um, we can do remote interviews. We can schedule them on that Saturday. Does everybody think that's okay? I mean, we can set a time without... Um, I mean, it, it just means some of the judges may not have reviewed uh, their projects. I know a week seems like plenty of time to review projects, but I mean, I th yeah, if we, if we told them in advance that it was gonna be Saturday for interviews. I think that would work for Hope Christian School. I do have to find out, I mean, it's a total long shot. We weren't able to do our Washington DC trip, of course, last year and they're hoping to combine, you know, ninth and eighth this year for it. Um, and it's still a long shot to see if it's gonna happen, but I don't remember exactly when it's gonna be. Um, but that week right then is our spring break. So I'm, I'm gonna double check on that. Got it. Um, right, so you're saying students might be out of town on that Saturday. Yes, I will double check though and I will let you know for sure. Yeah, but it's virtual. You can call in on your phone. <laughs> that would be great, except I went on that trip one time. And if I ever go to Washington, D.C. on one of those trips again, it's going to be a senior citizen tour where everybody walks really slowly and we cut it down to like two miles a day. <laughs> Ain't going to happen, girl. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> on the average, senior division in D.C. will do 55 to 60 miles in those five days. It's that would literally kill me. <laughs> it's common, straight up common. Okay, because I think by having March 6th, we could just tell the kids they need to block off 9 to 4, and as soon as we have a time slot, we can pop that in. I think that works. <clears throat> it's probably going to um, give us more judges than less judges, I, I think, as well. Just like thinking historically, people who donated their time. Um, at a regional, when it's local in town, they might have donated a weekday to come judge um, if they were a teacher. But I, I think if, if we're talking about a super regional from home via Zoom, uh, I, we're gonna have a lot more people willing to do that if we do it on a Saturday. Um. You know, Gretchen's uh, suggesting that I do a, a poll for dates, and I'm not sure I know how to make a poll on the spur of the moment. I know how to make a poll beforehand, but um, um, maybe if everybody can just say in the chat, um, if, if the sixth doesn't work for doing remote interviews, what would be your preference? How about that? If you can just put in the chat, what would you, what would be your preference um, if we weren't going to set aside that Saturday for doing remote interviews? And if you're fine with that Saturday, you don't have to say anything. One day for middle school, one day for high school, nine to four. I agree with that one. So would you, would you want to keep it on the weekend, Karen? Yeah, I think that um, for, for judges, it's probably going to be easier for them to donate a Saturday, especially um, since so many of our judges usually are educators or family of educators. It seems like they can, um, we, with a, a virtual world with no subs, it's a lot harder to get away for a day with lesson plans um, in this environment, ironically, than in a traditional educational setting. And if we can do it on a Saturday, we're gonna probably have a lot more judges available to talk to kids at that time. Um, and if we can't do it, then that would be my backup idea 
so that it's as close to a normal year as possible so that people could maybe take a day off to do it. So you're not saying, um, you're not saying do uh, juniors on a Saturday and seniors on a Sunday. You're saying do everybody on a Saturday if we can. Yeah. And if not, then, then do uh, two days of the week. But I think we can do it on a Saturday. I mean, I think we get to say. <laughs> everybody who showed up today gets to say. <laughs> I, I have a question that I don't know if it's related to scheduling or not, but is there a spectator element uh, in this? Um, Brent, I think we'll do a better job making the projects public and, you know, getting the word out about the student projects so that people can go look at the student projects. Um, but we're not going to open up the, uh, we're not going to open up the interviews to the public because uh, that just gets too complicated. But that's also why um, we, we may need to have chaperones in the interviews. So, I'm hoping that might just work out serendipitously where on every panel there could be an educator. Mm -hmm. you know, we can keep our fingers crossed that it just happens to be easy and um, works out well so that it's not even an issue. Right, right. And we, we will try and keep that in mind with the judge assignments. Maybe I should ask you know, are you currently background checked? <laughs> I mean, another option would be to have like retired teachers that we could just have them be room monitors. So they That's wouldn't really have to idea. judge, they could just monitor a room. So if we've got 10 rooms, then we could have just 10 monitors just watch the rooms right away. And they get to sit there and just hang out and listen to them all day long. That's a great idea. You know, because they know what to look for. They've been there, done that. And it's like, and, and I think just listening to the interviews with, we might be able to get some people who don't want to judge because they're scared. So you're just there to listen. You don't have to like do anything. Mm -hmm. That works for me. I want that All job. Right. <laughs> okay, Louisa wants the job. <laughs> Oh, and I was going to suggest that if there was some kind of a letter that you could create that we could share with those teachers that we might know or um, uh, the uh, retired teachers, you know, um, that we could just farm out and say, hey, would you be interested in judging or being a monitor? And that way, you know, if we do need the monitors, we, we might have that covered. Great. Yeah. And uh, Rachel, that's a great idea. And um, if it's okay, I'll send it in an email after we open up registration. So if people get it, then there'll be the link right there to sign up as a volunteer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. And also I double checked on the uh, DC trip. It's not till the 14th of April. So we're good at least for regionals. <laughs> fingers, fingers crossed that you guys can go. Amen. <laughs> Um, and you know what, I, I've, I've been totally remiss today. Uh, I wanted to introduce everyone to um, Bethany Tabor. Tabor? Sorry, Bethany. Bethany just uh, came back to New Mexico from New York and is uh, joining us as uh, the NHG co-coordinator. And she, she's happy that NHG is a simple program <laughs> without a lot of ins and outs and that there's nothing you know really like complex or tough to grapple with at all so yay bethany thanks for joining Hi. us <laughs> it's nice to see you all nice to meet you all i'm excited to to be here and to be a part of nhd even if it is a little bit twilight zone <laughs> well, i i was telling bethany that i'm still learning how it all works, especially how it looks like from where you all stand, you know, what it looks like in the classroom, what it looks like with your kids, what they're going through, you know, how it is for you all. So whatever kind of feedback you all can give us, we really appreciate it. Helps us, you know, do a better job supporting everybody. So. Did, did anybody else have any questions? Because we're, we're a little over an hour here. Uh, yes, Gretchen, nationals will be virtual this year. 
they, they had to make the call uh, with the University of Maryland. Uh, your uh, PowerPoint, will that be available? Because that was some really good information. On yeah, I'll send it to everybody who was registered. But like I said, I'll, uh, the recording, this whole recording will be available as well. So. Right, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And thank you for everything. You're awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you guys for everything. I appreciate your time today. And uh, I really appreciate everything you're doing for National History Day. And reach out to all of us, Louisa, Victor, Aaron, Bethany, me, we're all, we're all here to help. <laughs> thank you. All right. Have a good afternoon, y'all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you, Ellen. Thank you. Yeah, good to see you.